What a powerful trailer that was for Sword Art Online Elicization Liquoris from Tokyo Game Show 2019. Every character seemingly at their lowest, mentions of loss and failure, Asuna reveal as Stacia or maybe not as Stacia, and a whole lot of Medina not being able to cope with whatever is happening to her. Unlike the explained for Elicization Blading opening, my trailer coverage of Licorice will be an analysis instead. The trailer is incredibly stylistic and vague in general, as well as features a lot of in-game original stuff that I cannot hope to explain all of it, but I can analyze it for you and hopefully contextualize some of these incredibly powerful moments. Welcome everyone, it's me GamerTorp, your most reliable source of SO information, and let's have a look at the Licorice TGS 2019 trailer and all of its secrets. First off, if you're interested in trailer slash story analysis, I have an entire story theory based on previous trailers, things may be signaling that unlike the main canon, Kirito has lost all of his real life memories too, so that was a theory I explored in an earlier video, the trailer does nothing to contradict that earlier theory as well, so I recommend you check that out if you're interested, it allows for incredibly personal story possibilities, you can click the icon on the top right to watch that first. A new War of Underworld trailer is arriving this weekend as well, so you should also definitely subscribe and hit that bell icon so you don't miss my coverage of the trailer. But moving on to the TGS trailer, it sure does strike you at the very beginning with its music choice. Compared to a trailer that usually uses game soundtrack, Licorice trailer features Vivaldi Storm, which is not a coincidence, the entire trailer is designed around this orderly chaos that is definitely fitting to the music choice here. But before we begin with the first sentence, here comes a warning. While I will analyze the sentences here as well, Japanese does not really have specific gender pronouns, so when you see someone mentioning a certain he or a she, there's a chance that it may be forged without context and thus has a potential to be misleading. This analysis assumes the pronouns are within the correct context. Obviously, as trailers do, this trailer showcases stuff from the game as well. If you're Continuing, I'm assuming you won't be one of those weird people who does not understand the simple concept and writes down DUDE THIS IS SPOILERS It isn't, it's a goddamn trailer featuring stuff that has been revealed for the main canon months ago Anyways, with the rant out of the way for that very specific final scene of the trailer early on We start with the words of Medina It's quite easy to assume the he here is referring to Kirito but I would take the initiative here and argue otherwise. Later in the trailer we explicitly experience a major rift between Medina and Kirito, but I personally cannot see Kirito being a person who quote unquote treats someone so poorly and even more treats someone to be non-human. This is the person who even considered Ugachi the lizard killer to have human-like qualities at a certain point and did have some remorse that he has to absolutely kill the warrior, so with high certainty I have to claim that Medina is not referring to Kirito here. In fact, we know Medina comes from the noble Ortinanos family line that has been disgraced by the higher ups, so this appears to be more relevant to how people or someone relevant to her has treated her due to her surname, very similar to how Sortilina, Serlut and Golgoroso Balto are looked down upon by other nobles due to their stained family name. In fact, she is pretty much in the same situation as them. Remember, instead of using the traditional sword styles of the Northern Empire, the Norkian and High Norkian sword styles, Sortilina and Golgoroso's families were forced to use their own sword styles, the Serlut style and the Baltio style respectively. Just like those two, Medina is using her own Ortinano style, or at least that's what I believe is referred to by the Ortinano sword in many trailers. And her anguish here at the beginning is definitely a result of the corrupt nobility systems of Underworld rather than a personal conflict with Kirito, but she'll have a personal conflict as well with severe consequences based on this trailer, we'll get there in a bit. The trailer also has a bunch of on-screen text that hasn't been translated, so I'll provide details on that too thanks to the help of Gishimenos of course from the SAO Wikia. Some of them are quite basic and introductory, some are relevant to the context of certain scenes, and some are just <laughs> very vague in general. This first one is an introduction to Alicization. It says, Project Alicization, a project meant to develop a highly adaptive artificial intelligence, Alice to use as an autonomous unmanned weapon. 
Next up, we got scenes from the game as well as main cannon flashing on screen along with some voiceover. It's very easy to deduce if it's main cannon or game original. The first one is Quinella talking before the final climax began, Alice announcing her will to fight and Tisa pleading Yujiro for help. All of these scenes relevant to the Taboo Index and the Code 871 installed by Quinella's contact in the real world followed up by the contextual link, the intro card for the error code stating code 871, the name for a seal on the right eye, when someone defies the law like the taboo index and intense pain assaults the subject's right eye, limiting their thoughts and actions, underworldians are unaware of this name. But yeah, there's pretty much a continuity within every section in this trailer here between the slides. What comes up next is the encounter with Integrity Knights, we see Kirito fighting Fanatio, however the voiceover and keyframes are from Yujiro's encounter with Dusolbert, when the knight requests that Yujiro simply kills him as punishment and mercy and it's a quick and peaceful end, which throws Yujiro over the line as he screams the knight deserves no mercy. The untranslated text on the screen is Yujiro's first response to the request, Eradicate your life, you say, he asks. I particularly love the expression in Yujiro's face in the keyframe right here when Kirito stops and looks so much more conflicted than what we had in the anime despite being such a basic keyframe drawing. After we see Yujiro beating the wall that sealed up after Kirito and Alice got flung out, the topic shifts from Yujiro over to Quinella and the Integrity Knights again with the puppet description and visual similar to that from the light novels of Quinella creating the Axiom Church and the Taboo Index stuff featuring the title card for Axiom Church. However, the person in charge of the trailer actually used the wrong kanji with the correct pronunciation, so the way they spelled it reads Axiom Society rather than Axiom Church, which is just a mistake, don't read too much into it. Then we get Yujiro's transformation scenes with Cardinal's final words. So far it's all main canon stuff showcased in these short sections, however this title card here during Cardinal's final words state the world will end here. It's an interesting diversion to put here, especially considering it was only and only Cardinal's plan to end the world and this scene is a premature death scene. So this may be more of a metaphorical ending to the world, as this appears to be the moment that Elicization Licoris properly diverges from the Elicization canon. We got more scenes and at this point it gets more and more confusing regarding what's actually canon and what is not. We see Cardinal actively fighting back, somebody seemingly in the fusion scene. It appears to be either Kirito or Yujo, cannot be certain due to the hair being completely affected by the fusion effects slash anime wind effects, but we do know for a fact that Yujo survives the battle of the central cathedral, so do keep that in mind. This fusion is very likely to still be Yujiro, but as we have seen in other trailers, it does not really fuse with Alice Tsuberg's Flocklight as it still remains as the Blue Rose Sword, which Kirito proceeds to not allow it to fly away on its own and wields the sword instead powered up by that fusion. But before I move too far into the trailer, the narration over these scenes is the canon voiceover of Berkuli speaking to Yuji and the royal bats regarding Fanatio's life, and then we get Kirito shouting for an enhanced armament with the keyframes of this specific trailer. And what simply solidifies the theory of things really diverging is right here. So far, all title cards were here to sum up the previous segment it showcased. Taboo index card was right after the scenes where Yuji and Alice broke their seals, Yujiro's words to Dusolbert followed his fight scenes with him, Axiom Church came up after Quinella and Integrity Knight scenes etc. But follows the scene we just talked about is a title card stating Year 380 of the Human Empire Calendar, Episode 24, obviously referring to the anime Episode 24 of course, C sharp if slash route. This slide here makes it very clear that we are indeed diverging from the main canon in a significant way. And with that transition, we move over to the actual game original scenes, starting with a major conflict with Medina, but even that is combined with things you'll recognize from the main canon, which leads me to believe the trailer here is trying to give us an approximate timeline of these events maybe. We hear Medina stating that she does not want to seek help, most certainly due to her past traumas that is definitely tied to the first sentences she says at the beginning of this trailer, having lost all faith in others. Medina's sentence is also cut off by a dialogue script from the game itself. The dialogue is between Kirito and Medina and is as follows.
And that is probably the exact cutscene that follows this dialogue screen, with Medina visibly turning around in rage in a CG cutscene. This is cut off by Alice's narration towards Yujiro on the Cloudtop Garden, however the scenes that show up don't match up with the narration. We see what I believe is a male person with hand on his chest, which... Let me put it this way, his posture and facial expression seems very devious and the scene that follows it showcases a very angry Medina and another female character in the back, followed by the words Lost Children of Vecta as the next title card, with a lot of impossible to translate words in the background due to being overall without context and constantly cut off to not form meaningful complete sentences. So before we move on to the next section that gets even more confusing, let me bring things together with a theory. Somewhere in the Human Realm arc story, Kirito actually does meet Medina, who was already deceived by a lot of people due to her disgraced family name and thus has become an untrusting person in general. She refuses the help offered by Kirito and goes her separate way. During this time, Kirito and Yuju end up in the central cathedral and do their own thing per the main canon, while Medina is on the other side doing her own thing, whatever it may be related to saving the honor of the Orthinanos family. The lost children of Vecta is a slide that appears to be completely out of nowhere, however I don't think it's random at all. The person in the keyframe with the angry Medina in the back is a child and Medina seems like she is trying to protect her from this devious person that she is shouting at, while putting her body positioned in between the kid and the man, a protective instinctual behavior. So I'm assuming that the kid is also a lost child of Vecta, among others, and Medina has probably uncovered some grand scheme that actively endangers the lost children of Vecta everywhere. After a while, these two threads merge together, but first... We hear more lines from the main canon, but the visuals don't match once again. These visuals I do not recognize from the main canon. One thing I can recognize is that this is someone using a perfect weapon control or a memory release, having their sword raised and charging it up for a powerful move, with, you know, all the effects of charging up of course. The person using it seems to be Kirito, however that's quite a lot to assume from a rough sketch, so I'll leap forward a bit in the trailer to when Kirito unleashes the licorice flowers against Quinella while using the blue rose sword. So if you thought, you know, things were confusing so far, <laughs> ah, they are about to get even more confusing and we're just halfway through the trailer so far. I'll get to the bloom licorice scene in a bit, but I gotta keep things on track and go one by one to not cause further confusion here. We see a heavily redacted and incomplete dialogue that takes place between Kirito, Alice and Medina. I'll put a translation here as we talk, but remember when I said the person who was being transformed was not clear? Well, if, if I were to assume anything from this incredibly incomplete gibberish of a dialogue, I'd say Medina is definitely a crucial aspect of the sword transformation scene. In fact, if this dialogue is straight from the fusion scene, that explains the bloom crazily licorice scene perfectly. But it also comes with a huge implication that we will talk about in a second that Medina may not be surviving this ordeal. This is followed by Medina going absolutely crazy, which actually brings me back to the previous instance with the keyframes. It seems like Medina here is actively going against the taboo index, against that devious person in the end. In her voice lines you can hear how much pain she is in, and she is most certainly not handling it as well as Alice did for example. What I assume here is that whatever this devious person is doing with the lost children of Vecta, it eventually pushes Medina over the line and forces her to break the seal of the right eye, similar to Alice and Yujo in their own moments of defiance. In fact, you can already see it in these two split second frames, she's holding her right eye in pain in the first one and in the second one her head just jumps straight up and as you can see, her right eye has a different texture than the anime pupils you see on the left. That is definitely the seal of the right eye with the error code written in the middle of the eye. It also seems like they have specifically deleted the background from this frame. You can see the erasing marks back there and in the previous shot there was somebody actually standing over her shoulder. So this is undeniably an extremely vital moment in the narrative. The next split second frame is incredibly vague in terms of clear faces 
but that's also undeniably the moment Medina breaks her seal. She is on her knees, her katana is struck to the ground as she is in pain, you know, she's trying to clinch onto it. We see the one person she is protecting over her shoulder and the blasting effect coming from the right side of her face. This is followed up by more canon scenes as we ascend the tower, Fizel and Ninel talking, battle on the Cloudtop Garden, Fire Clown of Chudelkin, but next up we hear more from Medina's instance completely unrelated to the prior scenes. A male voice shouting that he will not acknowledge the stained name of Ortinanos and Medina thus turns her blade to him. And then, with the CG animation of Kirito vs Quinella, we hear Kirito devastated that he could not save her. Someone that sounds like Medina here, again, I want to be cautious because we're not familiar with the full voice range of the character yet, but it does surely sound like her, begging for mercy, begging to be let out. With Kirito shouting to the licorice flowers to bloom, marking the end of the climax of the trailer. Now, this is where we will go full theory, because things are getting extremely vague and edited in a possibly deceiving manner. We go back to the scene with Medina breaking her eye seal. This is followed up by the antagonist not acknowledging her name, which leads to Medina drawing her sword to slay this person. Of course, killing someone is obviously a severe breach of the taboo index, so he is captured by the Integrity Knights and brought into the Axiom Church. She begs to be let out before being synthesized, but made into an Integrity Knight in the end. The key bit that ties in right here is Kirito's regret of not being able to save her. Remember, earlier we were provided a dialogue where two crossed paths and Medina refused Kirito's help and went her own way that led to the events of her getting synthesized based on this theory. The theory obviously relies on her becoming one of the Integrity Knights in the church to prevent Yujiro and Kirito's progress. Naturally, they barely know anything about Medina and her past, so they have no real way of saving her, which turns the fight absolutely brutal, leading to Kirito fatally injuring Medina, the Integrity Knight. We fast forward to the Kirito vs Quinella fight, Medina's memory fragment is there on the ceiling according to the theory of course, which eventually arrives and fuses with the Blue Rose Sword or with something that allows Kirito to use a perfect weapon control or memory release based on the licorice flowers that symbolize Medina. Uh, that's one hell of a theory, Jesus I'm tired but wait there's more. Now, Futami had earlier stated that there are no branching storylines in the game, but he had also talked about how impossible it would be for other characters from the real world to appear, which we know is not true due to the War of Underworld spoilers that light novel readers will understand, so it's likely he wanted to not spill the beans back then, because these scenes we have been talking about has this major slide that translates to divergence with two arrows leading to two separate endpoints. Two possible meanings here because the trailer really wanted to be vague and artsy fartsy. One, this simply symbolizes that the game is diverging from the main canon for like the, the third time in the trailer I think. Or this slide is put purposefully right here when Kirito mentions he could not save her which you know what it means there is going to be a true ending. Unlike Fatal Blood or any other game with an actual branching storyline, this is not really that, it's more like what Hollow Fragment did. The remake of Infinity Moment, Hollow Fragment, had two parallel going stories. One is the Aincrad story, the other Hollow Campaign. You could simply beat Aincrad without bothering with the Hollow Campaign and you would have finished the game no problem. You could however rescue Philia from the Hollow area as part of the Hollow campaign which would unlock some new events and the Philia ending as well. And then you could finish the Hollow campaign very early on which would unlock a special event in there at a certain point in the Aincrad campaign that would help you overwrite Hollow Strea with the real Strea that was consumed by the GM avatar and actually reach the canon ending of the game. I am thinking Licorice will have a similar feature in that aspect, we will have an opportunity to save Medina one way or another which will unlock certain events and cause minor or major changes here and there, but then again the trailer really really wants to act like someone is definitely going to die. In the final flashes the text says the world will converge which, which is... Uh, interesting to say at least when a prior text had literally said the world will end here, the, the 
The only thing I can think of regarding the World Will Converge line is War of Underworld spoilers that is not covered in any trailer so far, so if you do not want to hear it, please skip to the time mentioned on your screen and I warn you, this will be major spoilers. The line may be referring to both the underworld and the real world coming together in a sense. Considering I gave my full spoiler warning, I see no reason to hold back here because to explain I do need to go in full context here. During the war, the main plan of Subtilizer is to actually take advantage of real life players. Underworld is a seed based simulation and the only real difference is that it can speed up inside the world thanks to Flocklight Acceleration which a user needs an STL to take advantage of. However, if you disable the Flocklight Acceleration, Underworld becomes no different than any other MMORPG, running on real time, on the same infrastructure, on the same engine, built with the tool that comes with the character conversion feature. Gabriel Miller, after exhausting his virtual army of the Dark Territory for funsies I guess, turns to real world. As they have control of the main control room, they create a public port to the real world and advertise Underworld as a VR MMORPG to Americans to take advantage of as an army. As a response, the Japanese side opens a public port as well and well, I don't know what the world will converge means if it's not exactly that, the entire world converging with this virtual world. But with those spoilers out of the way, the final line once again reinforces that someone is not going to make it through this journey. Combined with Alice's line and the translation of the Japanese on the screen stating, the world will never forget you. It's obvious that someone is a goner, you know, however the story will shape up in the end. And Alice states that this was her first feeling as a human instead of a puppet, it just gives more legitimacy to the death of Medina in the end of the Human Empire arc instead of later in the War of Underworld, considering that is when she first gains her consciousness to begin with. What comes next is the Asuna reveal for Elization Licorice. I'm still baffled that so many people claim this was spoilers for the anime. First off, this is not at all how Asuna's arrival happens in the main canon, like it's almost a complete 180, so contextually you're not getting any spoilers here. And secondly, the fact that Asuna joins Underworld is in the key visual for the third core since a couple months ago. Either way, from the title card you can see it's titled Episode Licorice rather than 24 that was mentioned earlier. The scene is pretty much as you see here. Obviously Asuna just arrived, Alice still has her eye patch, the scene takes place in the Garden of the Axiom Church. In fact, it's the same place as where Kirito and Yujo fought against Eldri, as you can recognize from the fountain and the gazebo in the back. I can say more about the scene and how this is different from the main canon. But I feel like it's best I leave the context here away to not give you any actual spoilers. As I said, it's completely different from the main canon, you're gonna have to trust me on that. But to add to this, recently SAO Gameworks lead Yosuke Futami did make an important statement on Twitter. He claimed that Asuna here was not the Stacia Super account, though again, the costume is very clearly designed by Stacia. It has the trademark tiara in the back which all underworld gods do have fancy headpieces and which definitely inspired Quinella to have her own tiara as well. But also the gem piece on her chest, it's very much inspired by Stacia which makes it hard for me to believe Futami on this one. Seems like many people were having similar thoughts that he had to reply to his own tweet saying, really guys it's true. Either way, Take that piece of information as you will, but that brings us to the end of this video, which... God damn, it has been quite long, I'm tired recording this. I hope you enjoyed my analysis, if you did, please do let me know in the comments, and by pushing that like button, 25k merch is available, so if you want to mark yourself as one of the original 25k subs, link will be in the description and pinned comment. For more on Sword Art Online, make sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon. We are getting a new War of Underworld trailer really soon, so I highly recommend you click them to get the latest news. Huge thanks to my patrons and members as always, until next time, stay cool.